Good morning. <clears throat> My name is John Ferraro. So just to begin with some relatively rudimentary information, uh, what is ECOG, electrocochleography? And by the way, that's the way I abbreviate it. Uh, some people do differently. There's capitals, there's lowercase, whatever you choose to do. But this is the one that uh, I've been using for years and, and as have several of my colleagues. Really what it is is a technique, not a particular response itself, but it's a technique for measuring certain responses or evoked potentials. And primarily the ones that we measure with ECOG are the stimulus-related potentials of the cochlea and cranial nerve 8. This is a diagram of the clinically popular family of evoked potentials. And as we can see here, we have, if we classify them according to latency epoch, where we have the short or early latency responses, the middle latency responses, and the long or long latency responses, or light ones, ECOG really involves recording the shortest members of the short latency uh, evoked potential family. And then again, those including the receptor potentials of the cochlea, in particular, the cochlear microphonic, or CM, the summatic potential, or SP, and then the whole nerve, depending on what kind of stimulus you use, or compound action potential of cranial nerve 8, which is virtually the same component as wave 1 of the auditory brainstem response. This shows what happens when the hair cells bend towards the direction of the tall ones, uh, specifically an inner hair cell where the ion channels in the cilia open allow for depolarization, which changes the electrical state from rusting to active inside the hair cell, and eventually leads to the excitation of an afferent uh, dendrite uh, coming from uh, at the base of the inner hair cell. That will then uh, convey the signal uh, through the auditory nerve and uh, when that happens, it causes the generation of what we call, again, receptor potentials. And a receptor potential is simply defined as the first uh, electrical signal that the stimulus has been received by the cell. So the depolarization process and exchange of ions takes the hair cell from a resting state uh, where we have DC potentials set up between the endolump and the organ of cordy fluid to a more active state, which changes really when the current is driven through the hair cell, the electrical environment of the hair cell. So the two potentials we're interested in within the hair cell, the receptor potentials, and then the whole nerve or compound action potential, <clears throat> and uh, which is different than the all or none action potential generated on an individual auditory nerve. We'll talk about that in a second. That signal is then conveyed through the nerve into the auditory uh, brainstem and up through the auditory pathways and actually back down again. But we are only concerned anatomically for electrocochleography with this relatively small uh, group of structures here that include, again, the cochlea and the uh, cranial nerve 8. The ECOG components, cochlear microphonic, a CM is generated by the hair cells in a normal ear, uh, predominated, uh, dominated by the outer hair cells, whereas we now think the cochlear summating potential is, uh, is a product of inner hair cell transduction. Compound action potential of the auditory nerve then represents the synchronous firing of several thousand nerves that have fired together to that particular stimulus. It's important to remember that an individual nerve firing is an all or none activity, i.e. each individual nerve fires at maximum capacity or doesn't fire at all. But if we're looking at the combination of several thousand nerves that have fired, that's actually a graded response depending on how many individual all or none firings contributed to it. This is a picture of an acoustic signal, obviously a tone burst with a very fast rise fall time and a relatively long plateau that's put into the ear. Here's what it looks like if we have an electrode seated on the round window or the promontory in response to that signal. And what we see mostly dominating the response is a pattern that looks exactly like the stimulus, uh, which it does to low and moderate levels of the stimulus. And that, of course, is the cochlear microphonic, really represents the changing potential difference between the, the scalar media and the scalar tympani or vestibuli as that transduction process is going on. Some consider it to be the electrical motor of the uh, hair cell. 
This little blip here, which is pretty much overshadowed by the CM, is the onset response of the whole nerve action potential. And then this upward shift in the baseline of the electrical floor is a DC unidirectional shift, which can either be positive or negative, depending on a variety of factors. And that's the so-called summating potential. Being a DC shift to an AC stimulus, the summating potential is considered to be a distortion product of the transduction process, transduction process. And that's an important component or, uh, for us to remember when we're talking about the use of ECOG for uh, endolymphatic hydrops. These are responses to a click stimuli. I think this was first drawn by Al Coates, or presented by Al Coates back in the 1980s, and it shows what the response looks like to a broadband click stimulus. If we present the click and rarefaction and condensation polarity, rarefaction the solid line, condensation the dotted line, we see a brief shoulder that precedes the onset of the first negative peak of the action potential, or N1. And again, these are overlying rarefaction plus condensation responses. If we add those responses together, we will eliminate any component whose phase is dependent on the phase of the stimulus, which is the cochlear microphonic. And that leaves us with, again, this brief shoulder, because the click is such a short uh, duration stimulus, that precedes the APN1, and that brief shoulder is the so-called summating potential component. If we subtract the responses, that will eliminate the summating potential and the action potential because their phase is independent of the signal phase. So we can either choose to enhance the SP and the AP to a click stimulus or the cochlear microphonic. This particular pattern right here, the combination of SP and AP or the SP-AP complex is the one I'm going to feature most during this presentation. How do we record these uh, components in humans? Uh, well, there are two general approaches. One is called transtympanic, which simply means we go across the tympanic cavity by perforating the eardrum to rest the tip of the electrode generally on the promontory, cochlear promontory, or during intraoperative procedures. It's possible to have a round window electrode, for example, sitting in the round window niche. Extra tympanic approaches simply means we're outside of the tympanic cavity. And those sites include the ear canal and one that we've been using for several years now, the, actual, the lateral surface of the tympanic membrane, or TM, itself. Okay. These are pictures of a guinea pig cochlea that I took when I was doing postdoctoral work with Peter Dallas, and we were doing intracochlear recordings from each individual turn of the guinea pig or the chinchilla because they have a cochlea that sticks into the middle ear cavity, which is an eight-shell device uh, covered by what I call the bulla. Obviously, the closer we get to the generators of the responses, the more accurate and sensitive our recordings are going to be. But since humans don't have a cochlea that jets into the middle ear cavity, we have to make use of other non-invasive approaches, obviously. This is an electromyogenic electrode, which is an EMG electrode, which is generally used to stimulate for EMG purposes. But if you reverse the input and the output, it can also be a recording electrode. It's designed to penetrate the TM Again, to rest on the promontory, here's a round window electrode that we've used for intraoperative monitoring when the middle ear cavity is exposed during that surgery. Okay. This is an old drawing of how the transtympanic electrode uh, can be applied. It's inserted through the rubber uh, sound delivery uh, tip of, uh, of the sound delivery tube, the, the foam tip. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the authors of the study didn't communicate well with the artist because I don't think they actually stuck it through the umbo. Uh, generally, it's designed to go through maybe the lower anterior quadrant, inferior interior quadrant of the TM, and then push through until it touches the promontory. The TM electrode, uh, this is kind of one of the original versions of a homemade device that we used to use. It simply is, it consists of a insulated silver wire, which is the insulation is taken off both ends, that's threaded through a very soft, flexible, silastic tube, and then either a cotton tip, we used to use rubber tips, are hooked to one end, tucked into the tube. The other end then is clipped to the cable leading to the preamplifier of the evoked potential unit, 
This is then saturated right prior to use with either saline or electro gel and uh, inserted along the ear canal to the TM. Since we started using these devices, these TM electrodes have become commercially available, and this is the one we've used successfully for several years now. It's uh, produced by Sanibel, which is a subdivision of uh, Interacoustics and uh, William Dumont. It uh, comes prepackaged like this, and if you remove it, you see it's pretty much uh, modeled after the quote unquote Temptrode I described in the previous slide, and we started calling it the Temptrode several years ago for obvious reasons. Again, silastic tubing, a wire, a connector designed to fit into the preample of an a preamplifier input of an evoke potential unit, and then a soft rubber tip that's got conductive material in it, which again is designed to be coated with electrode gel in this particular case, gel, not paste or wax, but gel, and then applied into the ear canal that way. This is a video courtesy of my friend and colleague Paul Kalaney, who shows how the, uh, uh, the electrode can be inserted. As you can see, he's spreading the ear canal apart with some uh, a retractor. The electrode tip, now coated with gel, okay, is inserted very gently until it makes contact with the TM. Paul uses an operating microscope. I generally have found that not to be necessary, and I'll explain more in a bit. And he gently removes the retractor, the electrode stays in place, and eventually what happens is we use the, again, foam rubber tip of the transducer, squish it down and stick it only into the entrance of the ear canal, and that's sufficient to hold the electrode in place and also deliver the sound. And there's Paul sticking uh, the rubber tip into the ear canal now. Very importantly, okay, and here's a drawing of what the electrode looks like in place with the foam rubber tip. And again, we have found it useful not to put it that far in. In fact, sometimes I'll cut the tip in half it makes it even smaller and a little more comfortable. You don't want to push too hard because that will shove the electrode against the TM and may cause some discomfort. It's also important to note, however, that if you push it against the TM, it will not penetrate the TM because the silastic tubing is soft enough that it will allow the electrode to bend instead of go forward. However, pushing it against the TM uh, yeah, forcefully can cause some discomfort. So it just has to lightly be touching the TM what I do when I put the electrode in is I explain to the patient I have this electrode. I'm going to run it along the ear canal very slowly until it just touches their eardrum. And then I want them and then I ask them to tell me when that happens. And uh, most of the time they, they can accurately say, oh, yes, it's there. Sometimes it's like I think it's there. Then I mush a little farther and they say, oh, for sure it's there. Sometimes it's there and they're not even aware that it's there. But the other indication I use is I go back to my volt potential unit and I look at my raw baseline EEG. When the electrode isn't touching, that EEG will be very noisy, peak clipping, turning on the artifact reject, etc. But when it touches the TM, the noise floor drops dramatically and becomes much more stable. That's another good indication that you're on the TM, again, without the use of an operating microscope. Uh, in fact, otoscopically, I have gotten away with doing that for years and years, and it seems to work just fine. Very importantly, the electrodes, the commercially available one, comes with a special cable that's designed to be uh, a device that also allows you to ground the shielding of the electrode. So this green input would plug into your common or your ground port, along with the ground electrode or common electrode that you have in your electrode montage. And here's the hot input into one of the either primary or secondary ports of the preamplifier. Again, this device is designed to help eliminate artifactual noise, electrical noise, from entering the recording. Keep in mind that this electrode is going to give you, uh, is going to be noisier than most surface electrodes that are applied to the skin, because the tip is smaller, but it's also an antenna that has a certain length and it can certainly attract and pick up anything uh, electrically going on in the environment, especially stimulus artifact. This cable is very helpful at helping to reduce that. 
These are responses uh, from a study that we did back in the 1990s that looked at transtympanic responses compared to extra tympanic from the tympanic membrane responses in the same patient. To my knowledge, it's the only study that's ever shown recordings done simultaneously on the same patient from the eardrum and the promontory. And what you see here is a pattern that represents the SP component, again, the blip. In this case, it happens to be enlarged in comparison to the AP component. But notice how stable the baseline is. The extra tympanic recording, the TM recordings, also show an enlarged SPAP and SPAP relationship, which is the diagnostic feature we're actually looking for in these patients. But it's a little noisier, which is inherent to extra tympanic recordings, and it's smaller. Notice that the amplitude scale here is 4.9 uh, microvolts per division. Here it's 1.2. So transtympanic responses are going to be about four times, four to five times bigger than extratympanic responses. But as I like to say, this is why God created the signal averager, so we can just simply take more averages to achieve a response whose diagnostic feature is preserved at the eardrum and certainly seen at the promontory as well. So the decision to perform transtympanic versus extratympanic uh, depends on a lot of factors, but there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Obviously, the closer we get to the generator, we expect a larger signal-to-noise ratio with a transtympanic uh, needle electrode. That means the components will be bigger, you don't have to spend as much time signal averaging, and they're usually very stable and repeatable. The disadvantage, of course, is you need medical supervision. If you're an audiologist or a non-medical uh, person uh, performing this, uh, you need uh, to find a, a physician to help you do it. Uh, penetrating the eardrum is not done without considerable pain at times and discomfort to the subject, so the eardrum has to be anesthetized. Sometimes that's simply done with a drop of furosemide on the eardrum, which burns itself, and the electrode then uh, perforates the spot where the furosemide is. And then I've worked with physicians who have been actually injected lidocaine into the ear canal to do it, which I think was as bad as the transtympanic uh, needle. And when that happens, there is no part of a transtympanic response that at least at some time during that procedure doesn't involve subject discomfort. Uh, the advantage, obviously, of the extratympanic approach is that it's non-invasive. You don't need medical supervision or an anesthetic. And if you do it cor or correctly, it shouldn't hurt. And I've been doing this for years, and some people do report some discomfort. If the electro tip happens to be touching the annular ligament of the TM, that tends to cause a little more discomfort than if it's sitting on the TM itself. The problem is, of course, the responses are going to be smaller in amplitude. You need to signal average more, and they tend to be more variable. But that's a small price to pay, I think, for the non-invasive advantages uh, afforded to us with the extra tympanic approach. The decision to perform TM or TTE cog, if you have a medical personnel who want to do transtympanic responses, that's great. If you don't, uh, you're not going to be doing them. And that may involve the traditional practices of the clinic and the dollars involved. Obviously, the transtympanic approach is usually a more expensive procedure. Over the years, one of the things I've rarely, if ever, seen considered in the decision to perform transtympanic or TM is the attitude or preference of the patient i.e., we're going to do this approach. You have two choices here. One involves sticking a needle through your eardrum. The other involves resting an electrode comfortably on the outside of your eardrum. Which would you prefer? I think the answer to that is going to be obvious for most patients. And then nobody really ever considers the cost to the patient, or at least I've not seen any reports to doing that. Bottom line to this is that my responses or my recordings over the years have primarily been done from the tympanic membrane. And so most of the data that you see presented in the next few slides are uh, accomplished or achieved with our TM recordings. We can't uh, forget about the Tiptrode device, which I'm assuming most of you, uh, you are familiar with this device. It's simply, again, the foam earplug of the tubal insert transducer wrapped in conductive gold foil. It's designed to be coated with electrode gel, squished down, and then put into the ear canal so that it rests comfortably within the outer third or so of the ear canal. And several recordings can be done that way. Uh, again, I don't prefer this for electrocochleography because the TM recordings, as you'll see in a couple of slides later, are going to be much more sensitive and bigger. But we still have applications for this uh, in children in particular. This is the tubal insert. Uh, 
uh, sound uh, generator that we tend to use, and I strongly recommend doing away with headphones when you're doing ECOG using one of these devices because the tube itself has, helps to separate the actual transducer from the ear or the electrode, which helps to reduce the noise. You have to take into account the amount of time it takes for the sound to travel through the tube, but that's usually a correction factor built into most uh, current day evoke potential units. It's about 0.8 to 0.9 milliseconds. And again, that correction factor then is separated from the actual uh, absolute latency measure to accommodate the travel time through the sound tube. These are responses that were recorded way back in the late 1980s by my two buddies, Paul Stopkowski and Steve Stoller, who show what it looks like to record an electrocochlegram from the outer portion of the ear canal, moving it closer to the mid portion of the ear canal, and then using a TM electrode. And as you can see, it's a near field, far field sort of thing. The closer we get to the generator, i.e., which would be the cochlear uh, air cells and the auditory nerve, the bigger the response tends to be. And in this particular case, bigger really is better uh, because the responses will tend to be more repeatable, stable, and easier to measure. Our recording parameters for TM ECOG are virtually the same as recording for the ABR with some notable exceptions. Uh, we prefer to use the TM site or the tympanic membrane as the positive or non-inverting site for the electrode. And the secondary or reference or inverting site, we use the contralateral earlobe or mastoid. This is a horizontal montage, which we have found to produce slightly bigger responses than using an ipsilateral montage, meaning that the secondary site is the test earlobe or mastoid. Signal averaging time should be five to 10 milliseconds. We are only interested in really the first five milliseconds of the response, but we give it some latitude here. If we're using broadband clicks, uh, that's the case. If we use tone bursts, then we extend the time uh, to a longer period to accommodate the duration of the tone burst. Big important difference between ABR and ECOG has to do with the filter bandpass. Since we're trying to record both an AC and a DC component, the summating potential being the DC component, which has no frequency, we have to lower the low frequency setting of our bandpass filter down to 3 hertz. 5 hertz actually works. John Durant and I showed we could even raise it a little bit above that because even though the SP is a DC response, we're looking at it in response to a very brief click stimulus, which makes it look like a little sinusoid. And so we've called it a quasi-DC response, which means it's capable of some filtering. But the filter setting has to be very low, again, because we're trying to include now the SP and the AP component uh, in our complex of measurements. We usually take anywhere between 500 and 1,000 with good electrode contact on the TM, 500 uh, to 750 is, uh, should be sufficient. Here are recordings taken from the TM showing two different ways to measure the SP and the AP components. The one that I have preferred for years is to measure actually the absolute amplitude of each component. And the absolute amplitude of the SP is defined as what the onset of the SP is. And in a normal ear, the onset of the SP generally occurs at about 0.3 to 0.5 milliseconds after stimulus onset because it takes some time, obviously, for the signal to travel through the outer and the middle ears, even though we've accommodated the 0.9 millisecond delay that we'll see if we use a tubal insert transducer. And then we measure the amplitude of the AP from its onset to the peak of N1. So we're measuring the preceding uh, portion of the AP, not necessarily the, the, uh, the Follow the peak to trough measurement that's conventionally done with measuring uh, ABR amplitudes. And when we get these two measurements, we then divide the S, uh, a, the, we then the form a, the SP over the AP amplitude ratio, which is, you're going to find out in a bit, very important uh, measurement for uh, helping to diagnose endolymphatic hydros. Some folks will choose to measure the amplitude of both components with respect to a pre-stimulus baseline or even a baseline that was recorded slightly after the stimulus has been uh, presented. We have found that that baseline tends to be variable and it's not very stable. And so we've abandoned that approach 
and simply use this approach. You can use this approach, but it will give you different norms than this approach. And it's important to then compare your clinical tracings back to the norms that you've established. And one of the problems we're going to see down the road is that we really don't have any set standardized guidelines for how to uh, measure several aspects of the electrocochlegram, including amplitude ratios and various other recording protocols. So that's a concern we'll talk about later. Nonetheless, again, bear with me on this one. We're going to use this way of measuring SPAP amplitude to derive the SPAP amplitude ratio. These are responses, sorry. These are responses to a tone burst. Remember that the receptor potentials have a duration that's dependent on the duration of the stimulus. And so if we don't want to see a tiny little blip of the cochlear microphonic or even the SP to a click, we can extend the duration of that stimulus by using a tone burst. And there we see a lengthened SP component it tends to drift back to baseline because of the amplifiers. The onset AP, we don't, we've eliminated the cochlear microphonic from this, then we could see and then we tend to measure, we pick a baseline and measure the amplitude at baseline compared to the amplitude at some point midway between where the SP starts and it ends. And we consider that the SP uh, amplitude. In this particular case, we don't uh, make use of the amplitude ratio. We're simply interested in the amp amplitude of uh, the SP component by itself. Okay, now that we have an idea of how to measure it and how to interpret our recordings, or at least uh, label them and interpret, let's begin talking about the clinical applications of electrocochleography, and there are several. However, it remains the case, and it has for decades, that the primary application of electrocochleography, when you're seeing it done clinically, is to help in the diagnosis, assessment, and monitoring of Meniere's disease slash endolymphatic hydrops, the Meniere's disease, of course, being the idiopathic version of endolymphatic hydros. And then I'm going to show you some data later on that says, you know, there may be another application here related to hydrops, and that is, can ECOG be used to possibly predict uh, the onset of Meniere's disease in asymptomatic patients? We also can use ECOG to make wave one of the ABR bigger if we use a combined ECOG ABR approach. Several patients with acoustic tumors have overriding hearing loss that preclude reliable recording of wave one. But I will show you that if we have at least a wave five, if we use an ECOG ABR approach, which basically means putting the secondary electrode on the TM, not the mastoid, we could virtually almost always get a wave one in addition to the wave five, which allows us to measure one five, possibly one three interwave interval. Uh, ECOG has been used over the years to uh, assist in intraoperative monitoring of inner ear and auditory nerve function when those structures are placed at risk and or, for example, during assistance with cochlear implant surgery more recently. Uh, ECOG has been used to help diagnose auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. I gave a presentation a couple of years ago, in, years ago in Sweden, and we came back to say, you know what, let's just go back to calling this thing auditory neuropathy. So I'm not sure what we're calling it this week, but it's going to be probably one of these two things. Let's call it auditory neuropathy. In this case, we're not really interested in the SP and the AP per se. We are more interested in the cochlear microphonic. ECOG has recently, in the last four to five years, been used to help diagnose this condition we're calling hidden hearing loss, where patients, mostly those who have been noise exposed, may have normal audiograms, but may also have tinnitus and hearing difficulties in certain situations. Come to find out, it's probably due to a deterioration of the nerve fibers that code for high frequency or high stimulus uh, sensitivity. We'll talk more about that in a bit, too. And then, uh, finally, our last one, and there, there are more, but here are more, the, the ones that are emerging now. ECOG has been shown to be helpful in diagnosing semicircular canal dehiscence and actually monitoring the surgical repair of that condition. But let's begin with uh, number one, uh, using ECOG to help diagnose, assess, monitor, and possibly predict uh, Meniere's disease or endolymphatic hydrops. These are old recordings that show, for the most part, but they exemplify how the electrocochlegram would look uh, in a patient who has high drops, in this particular case on the left side. 
And the characteristic finding we see is an enlargement of the SP component compared to the AP component in particular. So here we see an enlarged SP AP complex, whereas on the good side, the right side, the SP is relatively small. I'll be giving you normative data for this later on, but in general, we're looking at an SP that should be normally about 25% as big as the AP, maybe as much as 40%, but anything bigger than a 40% SP-AP amplitude ratio in response to a 90 dB HL click is considered positive finding for high drops. Here you can see the SP is about a quarter of the size of the AP, but here we see it's almost one to one, and this is an obvious uh, hydropic waveform. And the SP-AP amplitude ratio was the hallmark for, a, for an electrocochleogram positive for high drops uh, for years. Here again, I go back to the recordings from the promontory and tympanic membrane of the same subject. Notice the enlarged SP compared to the AP. That's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. It's been almost like a two-to-one ratio here. Point being that the, the responses from the eardrum displayed an enlarged SP-AP amplitude ratio just as nicely as those from the tympanic, uh, from the promontory. And again, what we're showing here is the diagnostic feature of the electrocochleogram that tells us whether or not it's positive or negative for high drops. Certainly is seen at the promontory, but is nicely preserved at the tympanic membrane as well. Here's a response to a tone burst in a hydropic ear showing the huge negative trough uh, that's displayed uh, by the summating potential. Compared to the other side, which was normal, which in a normal ear, you won't see much SP at all to a tone burst. So again, the argument is an hydropic electrocochleogram is really characterized by an enlarged SP component, and it becomes more consistent when we compare it to the AP. The rationale for this, this finding has never been thoroughly uh, answered or, or described. The simple rationale, and it may be incorrect, is that the SP is a representative of distortion in the transduction process will be bigger if there's something in the system that's causing more distortion. In this case, it's the pressure of the fluid in the scalar media, which has now uh, become hydropic, that's pushing down on the hair cells, pushing up on Reisner's membrane, but it's causing additional or positive pressure in, inside the scalar media. And when the transduction process begins, the summating potential being representative of that distortion uh, will become bigger. There are other theories that have been advanced for this, like maybe we're seeing a combination of the SP from both inner and outer hair cells, which makes it bigger uh, during hydropic situations. Uh, or there could be vascular changes, there could be biochemical changes, we don't know. But one thing I do know for sure after studying this for many, many years is that you definitely see an enlarged, at least what we're calling the SP component in a in patients who tend to be uh, positively diagnosed with Meniere's disease and or endolymphatic hydrops. Back in the day, a few years ago, we also did a study that looked at the sensitivity and specificity of the SPAP amplitude ratio. And what this uh, table shows is that we had 103 uh, patients that were tested uh, that were suspected of having hydrops. Almost half of the negative electrocochleograms here, okay, half of them had negative electrocochleograms, meaning that they had normal SPAP amplitude ratios. Almost the other half had positive uh, amplitude ratios. Those who had negative electrocochleograms, almost half of them received the negative diagnosis for high drops, but almost half of them received a positive diagnosis, despite the fact that the electrocochleogram was negative. That means it's not very sensitive. On the other hand, those patients who had a positive electrocochleogram, almost all of them received a positive diagnosis for high drops. So what this data and others in the literature have shown is that using the SPAP amplitude ratio alone is fairly specific, but not very sensitive. Sensitivity ranging anywhere from 50 to 60 percent, depending uh, on whose study uh, you read in the lit. So that challenged us to look for ways to make ECOG more sensitive to high drops. 
And one of the things that we did in our lab several years ago again is we decided to correlate the outcome of an electrocochleogram with the patient, with the symptoms the patient had at the time of the test. Recognize that it, at least in the early stages, uh, high drops from in years is a fluctuating disorder. Uh, and there are times when there may be no symptoms. There are times when there may be hearing loss combined with the other four symptoms. And these are the classic symptoms, as anybody who studies high drops or Meniere's knows. Hearing loss, tinnitus, oral fullness, pressure, and vertigo. Obviously, only hearing loss is the symptom that can be measured objectively. These others can be rated or scaled, but those scales and ratings are not generally very uh, reliable. And so what we did is we asked the patient at the time of the test, what symptoms do you have? And the reason for that is that we would get referrals from physicians for patients who were having symptoms suggestive of high drops. They would be seen by the physician. The physician would then refer the patient to us, and maybe a few days or a week or so later, uh, we would test them. Sometimes they had symptoms. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they had a combination of symptoms. And so what we looked at is we looked at the symptoms the patient had at the time of the test. And then we recorded whether or not their electrocochleogram was negative or positive for high drops. And so those symptoms included the individual symptoms of hearing loss, tinnitus, fullness, vertigo, and combinations of all the above. For example, 45 of our 110 years, those patients had absolutely no symptoms of high drops at the time of the test, and every one of them had a negative electrocochleogram. Theoretically, if they have no symptoms, their ear is relatively normal at that time. On the other hand, if we look at every asterisked category where hearing loss and fullness were part of the symptoms the patient had at the time of the test, whether or not just those two or in combination, virtually every electrocochleogram where the patient reported hearing loss and fullness was positive for high drops. We applied some fancy statistics and that, that showed us that the strongest predictor of a positive electrocochleogram was the patient who was complaining of hearing loss and fullness at the time of the test. And based on those symptoms, we could predict the outcome of an ECOG correctly 92% of the time. What's wrong with that scene? Well, theoretically, the test is supposed to be used to tell us what's wrong with the patient. The patient's symptoms aren't necessarily supposed to be used to tell us what the outcome of a test will be. But when I presented this data to the physicians uh, who sent patients to me, they said what ECOG offers us in this case is objectivity. Sometimes we don't necessarily believe the patient, and they may be inaccurate. ECOG and measuring ECOG can help me maybe monitor the effects of a treatment I have. And very importantly these days, ECOG can be pointed to in cases of litigation where a physician may be challenged for his treatment of the patient based on a diagnosis and ECOG. Uh, then can be helped, uh, can be used in reference to that. So what we continue to do, and one might ask, and I ask my students this all the time, if you see an electrocochleogram referred to you by a physician and the, and the patient comes in and says, I have absolutely no symptoms today, ethically, do you still perform the electrocochleogram? Chances are that's going to be normal. And the answer is yes, with a caveat, uh, yes, with some reservations. We do this to achieve baseline data, and then we do our best to get the patient back for a second exam as close to when they are having symptoms as possible. We tried that for a while, and I was getting calls at 3 in the morning from people who were saying, I'm dizzy and my ear is full, can you test me now? And obviously that presented some problems. And so that led us to continue the search, perhaps uh, in addition to waiting while the patient has symptoms to perform a test, to look for things that might be uh, even more contributory to making this more sensitive and specific. Uh, in 1995, Margolis and his colleagues in Minnesota also reported a finding that showed if you measured the electrocochleogram, and in this case in particular, the N1 component, if you measure the latency in response to condensation versus rarefaction clicks separately, high drops displays an abnormal latency difference between the recordings evoked by these two different polarity stimuli. In fact, if the latency difference was greater than about 
0.34, and in this case, it's 0.75. That was a positive finding for high drops as well, and it has to do with the neural response during upward versus downward displacement of the cochlear partition excited by either condensation or rarefaction clicks. Uh, there's more to it than that, but you can read the article if you want. And if you used alternating clicks, okay, you wouldn't see that pattern, but you might see a waveform that looks something like that. In our lab, this would still be an enlarged SVAP relationship. But pay attention to this depression of the overall uh, uh, complex itself when you add phase disparate ECOGs evoked with condensation versus rarefaction clicks. And so we're adding phase disparate N1 components. If we were just using alternating clicks or if we added these two together, this is what it would look like. When I read this, it reminded me of a study that was done back in 1980 from a British group, uh, Morrison et al., who showed an enlargement or a, an expansion of the SPAP duration in cases of high drops, and they attributed to an after ringing of the cochlear microphonic because high drops made the basal membrane more elastic. That that's never really been verified, and what I think these folks were looking at because they were using alternating clicks is exactly what Margolis was seeing back in 1995, i.e., the addition of phase disparate N1 components. But it also stimulated, stimulated us to say, well, in addition to looking at the amplitude of this component, what about the duration of the component as well? And if you take amplitude times duration, that simply means the area. So we negotiated with Novo Potential Company. We were using Nicolay at the time, way back when. And I asked them, can you build me some software that allows me to place a point on the waveform, extend a straight line, to the next time the waveform comes back to the initial baseline point and simply take that straight line and measure the area under it or the area under the curve. And so they sent us some software that was able to do that. We conducted some initial studies on it back in, uh, 19, uh, 90, in the 90s. And we had normal subjects, we had Meniere's patients with enlarged SPAP amplitude ratios, and then we had suspected Meniere's patients who had normal SPAP amplitude ratios. And then we measured the area. And the way we define this is we said the SP area is defined as the onset of the SP, okay, and drawing a straight line from the onset to the next point in the waveform that returned to the amplitude at onset. And then we called everything under that the SP area. We know that it includes the AP area, but for simplicity's sake, let's just call this whole thing the SP area. Then we simply took the onset of the AP and extended the line to P1, or where the uh, AP and 1 turned off, and we measured that portion of the waveform and called it the, S the AP area. And then we simply divided that into the SP area and to form the SPAP now area ratio. Here's a subject from group three where the amplitude ratio is normal, but notice the trailing edge of the AP never returns to baseline, which when we measure the area, enlarges the area of the complex, especially compared to the APAP, and that would give us an enlarged area ratio. Here's a subject from group two that had an enlarged amplitude ratio, and by almost definition, if the amplitude ratio is enlarged, generally speaking, that's going to make the area big too. And so this is both an amplitude and area ratio enlargement, positive again for endolymphatic high drops. And so when we went back and remeasured the electrocochleograms, we found that almost half of the patients who were suspected of Meniere's disease, but who had normal amplitude ratios, had enlarged SPAP area ratios. So we began using the area ratio, and we did it for several years. Back in 2009, we did an outcome study to see how sensitive and specific it was. And sensitivity and specificity is shown here. And what it showed very briefly is that when we considered an electrocochleogram to be positive for high drops, when the SPAP amplitude and or area ratio is above the normal range, we improved the sensitivity of ECOG in the diagnosis of high drops to 92%, considerably more than we'd seen before, while we maintain very high specificity at 84%. So again, I emphasize, 
If the amplitude ratio and the area ratio are positive, that's a positive finding. However, if either one of those by themselves is enlarged, that's also a positive finding. It is often the case where you may see a normal amplitude ratio in the face of an enlarged area ratio. However, I have rarely, if ever, seen an enlarged amplitude ratio in the face of a negative area ratio. And again, simply because when the amplitude of the SP tends to be big, that extends the area as well. We've also compared sensitivity and specificity to other tests that are used for high drops. And again, that includes video nystagmography, vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, and rotary chair or sinusoidal or harmonic acceleration tests. And again, ECOG shows us to be more sensitive and specific than any of these. Uh, caloric values, I believe, were the highest on the uh, VNG uh, test. So again, uh, electrocochleography, if, if recorded and interpreted or measured correctly, can be a very highly sensitive and specific test for endolymphatic high drops. And the way we did this is, is we tested patients and then we simply went back after the patient had been seen by the physician and received the diagnosis, compared what the physician eventually diagnosed that patient as having with the outcome of our various tests, including uh, ECOG, VNG, et cetera. Okay. Now, here are some normal and abnormal responses recorded with the Interacoustics Eclipse Auditory Evoke Potential Unit. Again, this is stimulus onset here at zero, and so shortly after stimulus onset, we see the onset of the SP, small blip, and then followed by the big negative uh, uh, AP. On the other side, the hydropic side, we see a considerably enlarged SP-AP complex. And if we now apply our measurements to that, for the normal ear, we start at baseline. We extend a straight line to the next point in the waveform, where the amplitude at that point is the same as it is as baseline. Amplitude here minus amplitude there equals zero. And then we measure the area under that curve, again, knowing that it includes a good portion of the AP as well, but for comparative sake, we'll call that the SP area. The AP area then, we take the onset of the AP N1, extend the line to P1 of the AP, or where N1 ends, and we call that the AP area. We can then use the computer software to calculate the various uh, measurements for those areas. And in this particular case, you see that the SPAP amplitude ratio is about 12%, where the area ratio is around 1. Uh, we have done some recent studies looking at normative data from a large group of patients. And in general, we find SPAP amplitude ratio, again, to a 90 dB NHL click meaning that those 0 dBHL values are how a young uh, group of young normal volunteers uh, responded to the click. Okay? We find that the upper limit of normal amplitude ratio to that 90 dB stimulus uh, click is around 40%, 0.4, and 1.8 or 1.7 or so for the area ratio. So we could say anything close to two here or greater is going to be positive. Anything greater than 40 to 50 percent is going to be positive for that, for hydrops. Here again, we have the hydropic ear showing an enlarged SP component. We measure the area of the SP, the area of the SAP. We find that the amplitude ratio was 1.25 percent, uh, 1.25, which is considerably greater than 0.4. And the area ratio is close to 2 at 1.9 or right on 2, also in large. Also should be noted that it's nice to put numbers on all of these things because it makes for good statistical comparisons and, and sharing of data across laboratories. But visual inspection of this waveform versus this one in the affected ear uh, is a great clue as to whether or not this uh, electrocochlegram is going to be positive or negative for high drops. These are some uh, tracings uh, that I borrowed from a friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Signa Grossel in, uh, in uh, Sao Paulo. And uh, she did several recordings using the interacoustics eclipse. Here's a young 29-year-old female who had incapacitating vertigo that uh, uh, started about a year or so prior to her coming in to be seen. They lasted for a day. 
Oral fullness in the left ear, worse during the vertigo attack, fluctuating hearing loss on the left side, high-pitched tinnitus, etc. She was put on methylprednisone uh, to help uh, compensate for those conditions. Here are pictures of her fluctuating hearing loss, showing again, indeed, that it's fluctuating. And then here are the pictures of her electrocochleogram. As you can see here, the waveform looks relatively normal. If you put all those numbers into the computer, they will be normal. On the other side, again, notice the enlarged SP component, making both the area and the amplitude ratios considerably bigger than normal. 23-year-old male who had tinnitus for three years with a drummer in a band, obviously getting some noise exposure, complained of poor speech discrimination, understanding and, uh, uh, and, and noise, and he had two ants with Meniere's disease. Uh, the fact that he was complaining of something in the face of a normal audiogram also indicates that this individual could have what we're now calling a hidden hearing loss. Okay. Here are his electrocochleograms showing again enlarged amplitude and area ratios on both sides, really, a little more prevalent on the right side. Could that be a genetic component, i.e., and we're going to talk about this in a bit, since he had two ants who had positive diagnosis. Here's a female, 42-year-old, sensory neural hearing loss. You can see on the left side, intense vertigo attacks that lasted six hours with ear fullness, increased tinnitus. Her MRI was normal. These are her electrocochleograms, which are normal with respect to high drops, but considerably reduced in amplitude, obviously, because of the hearing loss more so than anything else, most likely. And so what we think here is there's no bilateral high drops. The amplitude in the left ear is probably related to the loss of auditory nerve fibers, but not necessarily endolymphatic high drops. In our experience, important point, when hearing loss, especially in the higher frequencies, and if you're using a click, dip below 50 to 60 dB, we find the use of ECOG questionable when it's being applied to help diagnose high drops, simply because the hair cells are being affected to an extent that they're probably not giving a normal response. Bottom line to this is I like to use electrocochleography during the early stages of high drops when we're really not sure what's going on. And while hearing is relatively still good, especially in the higher frequencies, and we find that to be the most effective use of ECOG, as opposed to taking a patient who maybe has had it for a long time and whose hearing has deteriorated to a point where recording activity from the hair cells now has been compromised due to the disorder. 55-year-old male, strong vertigo attacks, etc., bilateral low-frequency tinnitus, oral pressure not related to vertigo, had hypertension, thyroid hypofunction, sloping high-frequency hearing loss, and his electrocochleograms show an enlarged SPAP amplitude and aerial component on the left side, whereas the right side may look normal. But the way I would measure this would be from here to here. Dr. Grosso measured it from here to there. And I believe the SP actually is starting maybe about here. And I'm not so sure had I measured this one we wouldn't have seen an enlarged area ratio as well in the face of a normal amplitude ratio. And again, notice the suppression of the component where the trailing edge of the AP never returns to baseline, like actually it does here in the hydropic ear, even though the hydropic ear has an enlarged uh, uh, amplitude ratio. Six months later, the patient still had an enlarged uh, area and amplitude ratio on the left side, but now the right side appears to be more normal looking. The last thing I want to talk about with respect to Meniere's disease is a study that we did a few years ago uh, that was actually motivated by a student I, I had. And when I teach the evoked potential class to my students, that includes laboratory exercises where they actually go in and do recordings on themselves. And when we were doing ECOG, one of our students uh, had a recording that was consistently positive for high drops, even though this was a young man who had absolutely no symptoms. 
And so I took him into the lab, did some recordings on my own, and indeed he did have an enlarged SPAP amplitude and area ratio, despite the fact that he had never had any symptoms and he had normal hearing. And he remarked at the time, gee, my mother had been diagnosed with Meniere's disease for the past 20 years. And so that stimulated us to ask the question, and the students himself actually did the study to see if we could record electrocochleograms in family members of individuals with a positive diagnosis to see what the outcomes of those electrocochleograms would be. And so this was the student. And again, the student's mother had a long history of Meniere's disease. Uh, there are certain familial aspects to Meniere's disease that in essence have shown approximately 20% or one-fifth of Meniere's patients have a close relative with this condition. So we began to gather pilot data that answered uh, the following questions. Can we use ECOG perhaps as a potential screening tool uh, for Meniere's disease? With the late onset of symptoms and the median age for Meniere's disease, uh, at least the onset of symptoms, is 51. Could there be a time prior to that uh, that the initiation of endolymphatic high drops might be detected? If so, uh, can we do anything to help avoid uh, the actual onset of Meniere's, uh, even though that would be very difficult to predict at this particular time? I.e., could there be genetic uh, reasons to expect it? Could there be dietary changes that a patient can undergo? Uh, could it be a treatment of allergies, infections, etc.? And the bottom line is, can those be applied to individuals who are either predisposed or beginning to develop Meniere's disease? So what we did, and it took a long time to get even 10 patients, we found five, uh, 10 family members who were either children or siblings of individuals with a confirmed diagnosis of Meniere's disease. Uh, they were all from different families, and they were recruited following a chart review of patients with confirmed diagnosis, and then those patients were called and asked to provide the names and contact information for their children or siblings, and obviously to give us permission to do that, and then contacting the children or siblings, and finally getting some of those to serve as subjects, again, took a long time and resulted in a relatively small uh, sample size. The results showed that when we measured responses from, again, asymptomatic children or siblings of patients with a confirmed diagnosis of Meniere's disease, Okay. One patient dropped out, so we only ended up with nine, but seven of those nine individuals had positive electrocochleograms, meaning either their SPAP amplitude and or area ratios were enlarged. Okay. In our laboratory, the incidence of a false positive is only around 10%. So this is considerably higher than that. Hmm. What we concluded, again, is almost nearly 80% of asymptomatic patients with confirmed Meniere's had positive electrical, who's, who had a, a relative, a, a mother uh, or father or a, a close family member, uh, had positive electrocochleograms despite the lack of symptoms. And again, the incidence in our lab of false positives is around 10%. It's important to include both SPAP amplitude and area ratios because either one of those alone doesn't give you uh, that much uh, sensitivity. Our future research is obviously this study is in its very formative stages. The sample size is very small. We need a much bigger one, and we also need to include subjects from the same families. Long-term monitoring of subjects for the development of years to days, obviously this could take years because if we have a relatively young person, and then they don't develop symptoms till they're in their 50s. I don't think I don't have a student who's willing to stay around for 20 years uh, working on their Ph.D. And I'm retiring shortly anyway, so I'm not going to be doing it. Uh, a real problem, which we'll talk even more about a little bit later, is standardizing ECOG recording approaches, parameters and interpretation guidelines across laboratories and clinics. ECOG is a test screaming for standardization. Would genetic testing tell us more or would it be better? Perhaps, but as far as I know, we don't yet have a genetic test for high drops or Meniere's disease. So it's something to look at down the road, uh, measuring a left cochlegram and a, and a subject uh, who is a sibling or a child of uh, somebody with Meniere's disease. Uh, if they would lend themselves to that, it could have both good and bad, I suppose, consequences. It could put somebody needlessly at worry of developing it.
or could maybe put this then falsely uh, 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 unaware that they may be developing it. So. Moving on, uh, this is the bulk of my presentation was really to focus on ECOG's use in helping to diagnose hydrops. I'm going to quickly go through some of the other applications, uh, those being one, the enhancement of ABR wave one. Uh, again, these are tip throat electrodes which are designed to go into the ear canal and several years ago I did a study with my late colleague and friend Roger Ruth that looked at the amplitude of the ABR recorded using a tip throat electrode, i.e. the secondary electrode uh, in the ear canal. And one point I forgot to mention, some folks like to see the electrocochlegram going up as the ABR, some like to see the econ going down, ABR going up, whatever. I prefer to see my electrocochlegrams, the N1 being displayed as a negative deflection, but I like to see my ABR peaks going up. Just a matter of preference. All that simply means is that you reverse the secondary and primary electrodes. If, you, if the primary electrode is seated on the eardrum, then the electrocochlegram will be displayed downward. If the primary electrode is seated on the high forehead or vertex or even the opposite ear, then the electrocochlegram will go upward and is recorded and looks similar to the ABR. So let's just focus now on N1 in particular. Wave 3 and 5 really didn't change much, but we always got a bigger wave 1 when we, our secondary electrode was seated in the ear canal, i.e. when we used the tip trip. And if you plot the amplitude differences at different stimulus levels, you see the ear canal responses are always bigger than those recorded with a mastoid electrode. And then we put an electrode on the eardrum and compared to those three conditions again, and guess what? Not surprisingly, the one on the eardrum was always bigger than the one on in the ear canal, which was always bigger than the one in the mastoid. And the application here is an interesting one. Here's a normal ABR recorded conventionally, i.e. the electrode, the primary electrodes on the high forehead or vertex, and it's referenced to a secondary electrode on the earlobe or mastoid. We see that the threshold of wave five is around 16 dB or someplace between six and 16, at least the visual detection level. We see that wave one drops out maybe around 30 or so dB. Notice that the amplitude scale here is 0.5 microvolts. Notice the amplitude scale here is the same, except it's much smaller. These are electrocochleograms recorded from the TM, again, We've changed our recording montage so that the N1 is displayed as a positive going peak, not a negative one like you've seen before. And we see how much bigger the APN1 is. This response is maybe one and a half microvolts big, uh, whereas opposed to this one here is maybe 0.25 microvolts. So getting on the TM itself gives you considerably bigger wave one as we expected. And if we searched for threshold of the N1 component, we see that it persists as long as wave five. The application for us is here's a subject that was suspected of having an acoustic tumor. We see nothing but a delayed wave five. And again, some studies have shown as many as 50 to 60% of patients with tumors have hearing loss sufficient to preclude the identification of a reliable wave one. Here we have re-recorded the auditory brainstem response with a positive electrode, the primary electrodes on the vertex, the secondary electrode or the inverting electrode now is on the tympanic membrane. So we call that an ECOG ABR approach. And then we do that, we see a wave one, a wave five, and even really a wave three, which allows us to measure the important interwave intervals. These were, by the way, within normal limits when we do it. So I like to say uh, if, if a subject has enough hearing to give us a wave five, Using a TM ECOG approach, you can also get a wave one to allow you, again, to measure those very important interwave intervals to help diagnose retrocochlear disorder. Intraoperative monitoring generally then to help preserve structures, protect them, and possibly even predict surgical outcome. The electrocochleography, these are really old slides. There's lots of recent studies on, on how we use it. But here's a case in a patient where a tumor was being removed and hearing was preserved as evidence of a N1 at closing. And here's a patient where we see during the surgical approach itself and the tumor was being removed, we lost the N1 component. This patient woke up with hearing. This patient had a dead ear when they woke up. 
Here's one that I was involved in several years ago where I was working with a physician who was doing an endolymphatic shunt surgery on patients with high drops. We can see at the onset of surgery, this area and amplitude ratio is enlarged. Back then, we were only using the amplitude ratio. But as the shunt was placed in and the fluid was drained, the responses returned to normal, and this patient had a good surgical outcome. Here's another one where the responses were enlarged to begin and never really improved. And here's the patient's electrocochleograms a few weeks after surgery, showing a still a fairly dramatic difference between the affected and the non-infected side. But this patient claimed to have a good surgical outcome too. So go figure. Here's cases, here's a case where ECOG was used to help identify where the endolymphatic duct was during a shunt procedure. And the surgeon was inserting probes into various areas since these structures really aren't color coded in a, in a live human. And when he inserted the probe into the endolymphatic duct, we saw an improvement of the SPAP ratio, which was an indication uh, of the site to place the shunt or at least uh, uh, the uh, fistula that was created by doing that. So there are a variety of uses for ECOG intraoperative monitoring. One of those is in cochlear implant surgery. Some and some recent studies have shown measuring the cochlear microphonic can give an idea of the subject's threshold. Uh, there are other applications. I have absolutely no experience in doing this myself, but I've uh, listed several references that you can go to, uh, recent ones, uh, that can help if you're interested in this particular area. In newborns and young children, this is where we diverge from our normal approach of putting an electrode on the eardrum. These recordings uh, uh, that I have from newborns and young children have all been done with a tip trode, a tip trode, not a temp, a tip trode like device. These are pediatric sound delivery tubes that can be hooked up to the tubal insert transducer. Here are the two sized tip trodes that are commercially available. The initial study we did on this one was simply to peel the gold foil off of a tip trode, which were too big, the tip trode itself, to put into a neonatal ear canal, okay? wrap it around the pediatric tip, go to, at that time, a radio shaft, which I don't think is no longer around, and bought a copper alligator clip, soldered that onto an electrode lead, and simply clipped a portion of the uh, gold foil onto the uh, electrode tip, inserted it into the ear canal after uh, coating it lightly with electrode gel, and we were able to record uh, ear canal recordings from newborns using this approach. Uh, more recently, we've simply found that cutting down the tip uh, of the tip trode to about a third of its length also allows us to make it small enough to put into the ear canal and the big advantage here in the initial studies we did were simply that you get a better wave one, as you might expect, if you record from the ear canal versus the mastoid or earlobe of a newborn. On the other hand, what we're most interested in for newborn hearing screening is not really wave one, but wave five, and there's really not much advantage of doing it for that. Okay. Again, ear canal, mastoid, ear canal, mastoid, always bigger wave one, which we expected in the they were in, interested to see even in newborns. However, what we do uh, uh, find more interest in is using an ear canal approach versus a regular conventional ABR approach when we're using ECOG to help diagnose auditory neuropathy. And in this case, what we see here is a slide from my colleagues, uh, Arnie Starr, Yvonne Sinninger, and their colleagues. Uh, where you see a normal auditory brainstem response that can also display the CM and the SP when you add or subtract waveforms. But in a child with neuropathy, we'll see the presence of cochlear components, i.e. the cochlear receptor potentials, in the absence of a well-defined auditory brainstem response. And so we're looking at a disorder that could possibly have a, an anatomical uh, 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 site somewhere between and including uh, the inner hair cells and the brainstem. Okay. These are responses from a study done by Barb Cohn-Wesson and her colleague Young that show 
what a cochlear microphonic to a click stimulus might look like. And that's just a simple series of sinusoids because the square pulse that is applied to the transducer is certainly filtered by the transducer to produce, in essence, what looks to be like a decaying oscillatory sine wave. And that's what a response to a click looks like, uh, as recorded uh, from, uh, in this particular case, conventional ABR. The important point of this slide, however, is to show that there should be and there must be a latency difference between the onset of the signal and the onset of the response. If the onset of what appears to be the response occurs at the same time that the signal was turned on, then you're most likely looking at stimulus artifact. And that's again because the cochlear microphonic, and one of the biggest concerns about using the cochlear microphonic over the years for diagnostic purposes, is that in humans, it sometimes is very difficult to separate out from stimulus artifact. In addition, it hadn't shown to be specific to uh, any particular disorder until well, we look at it with respect to auditory neuropathy. And so lately, and this is a, a very recent study done by Lisa Hunter and several others uh, who are combined their data, and they measured ABR, SP, and CM components to click stimuli in a normal, well-born nursery and the intensive care nursery. Found no significant group differences uh, with regard to latency and amplitude values, and they established normative ranges for auditory brainstem and ECOG latency and amplitude. And what they show here, uh, this is the SP component in those children, which again is... Uh, is measured by simply adding rarefaction and condensation clicks, getting rid of the uh, ABR, and this is uh, uh, the SP, the uh, cochlear microphonic component. And they have baseline values and normative values for these structures. Uh, my, my response to this study is that the cochlear microphonic is really pretty easy to see in these children, but the SP can be extremely variable. So I would, I would apply very cautiously using the SP to a stimulus recorded with a conventional ABR approach uh, to help diagnose neuropathy. I think using cochlear microphonic is a safer bet, per se. And so these are the waveforms in which I'd be interested. I would also like to caution you that the routine use of the cochlear microphonic and the diagnosis of auditory neuropathy should be applied cautiously. And the reason I say this is this is a, a case study that uh, I was asked to consult on. And this is the information we received from an audiologist who diagnosed a child as having auditory neuropathy. Obviously, the hearing testing in this child revealed no usable hearing per se, but directly from the case report, they also did an ABR, no wave five, photoacoustic emissions were absent. The child didn't respond to speech at any level. However, they recorded something that they called the cochlear microphonic and thought it was cochlear microphonic because when the polarity of the stimulus was reversed, a cochlear microphonic could be, to be present in both ears. And the presence of a cochlear microphonic suggested that this child had auditory neuropathy. Here are the waveforms that were sent to us. And again, you can see here the onset of the signal okay, was accompanied by a huge deflections, and a decaying oscillatory sine wave. When you see that, there may be something in there, I guess, CM-wise, but when you see something like this that starts at the onset of the signal, it too will reverse its polarity as the stimulus polarity is reversed, but what we were looking at here, we identified as pure stimulus artifact. In fact, when we did the test, the ABR was flat, indicating that there was probably hearing loss, but certainly no evidence, at least verifiable evidence, of uh, auditory neuropathy. ECOG and hidden hearing loss, several studies now, recent studies, uh, animals, Kajawa and Lieberman, from it at all. And in humans, uh, Greta Stamper, one of our doc students, and her uh, mentor, Dr. Tiffany Johnson of our faculty, as well as Brommel at the VA, and again, Lieberman at Mass Eye and Ear have all showed that noise exposure leading to temporary hearing loss, quote unquote, TTS, which we've been calling for years, reduces the amplitude of the ABR wave one component. And for years I've been telling my students don't pay too much attention to amplitude of the ABR, pay more attention to its absolute latencies and interwave intervals. 
But now we have studies that show a person with quote-unquote hearing loss that may not necessarily be identifiable via conventional audiometric approaches has a smaller amplitude of wave one. And so the assessment of hearing should include the evaluation of superthreshold measures of auditory function. I and mean, what's our gold standard of measuring hearing loss? Asking a patient to tell us how softly they can hear a sound. The cochlea now reveals the presence of nerve fibers that actually code for sounds presented at superthreshold levels. And those are the fibers that seem to be most susceptible to damage due to noise exposure. And the damage can be due either with the nerve fiber itself as it innervates the inner hair cell or perhaps even the spiral ganglia. These are studies by Lieberman that compare SP, AP, and amplitude ratio in high-risk and low-risk individuals, high-risk meaning those that had a lot of noise exposure, low-risk meaning those that don't. They showed enlarged SP, AP amplitude ratios in these subjects, but not necessarily because the SP reflected high drops. It's just that the AP was smaller in comparison to the AP, which didn't change, but still made the amplitude ratio bigger. These are studies from Bromel et al. using the VA population that were non-veteran, veteran uh, that used firearms, veterans with high noise exposure, and veterans with very low noise exposure. And we find that those with the most noise exposure okay, have the smallest N1 amplitudes. Again, high noise, black. Problem with studies like this is finding a control population, obviously, that doesn't have noise exposure. And how do we define a history of noise exposure versus people who have it, people who don't? It's a very difficult problem with this. Greta Stamper and Tiffany Johnson looked at the same sort of thing and again found that those with low noise exposure had bigger wave ones in humans. Now, this was the first human subject to show this than those with a higher noise exposure. And our noise exposure was determined via a noise exposure questionnaire that was developed in our program, and there are others that are going around. But again, these noise exposure questionnaires are limited to the fact that uh, uh, they're applied to a large group sample of people, and they're asked to rate uh, their history of noise exposure really throughout their lifetime, or at least throughout the uh, previous few years. And it's very difficult to find uh, populations these days wherein uh, the individuals that comprise these populations had not been exposed to noise at least sometime during their life, especially if you're measuring uh, these in college students. And then finally, using ECOG to help diagnose superior semicircular canal dehiscence. These slides are from uh, Paul Colaney who shows uh, what an electrocochlegram may look like in the case of uh, dehiscence. And what we see here is a simple, almost the same thing we see with high drops and enlarged SPAP amplitude. And although he didn't measure it, area ratio as well. The rationale here is that we've created a third window that's leaking paralymph. If you leak paralymph you, and you look at the natural uh, pressure relationship between uh, endolymph and paralymph in the cochlea or the pressure difference between the scala media and the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli. Uh, when you have high drops, the scala media displays a positive pressure, which we think enlarges the SP. However, if you drain paralymph, you will also increase the pressure within the scala media to compensate for the negative pressure on either side of it, again resulting in an enlarged SP component. So what we tend to see in superior canal dehiscence, and by the way, also in paralymphatic fistulas, even at the round window, is another condition where we would look at and see an enlarged SPAP amplitude ratio. Paul also does intraoperative monitoring, and here's a case wherein the patient went in with a large amplitude ratio, and as the fistula or the dehiscence was being repaired, the SPAP returned to normal values, and this patient had a good surgical outcome. So the last thing I really want to mention again, and this is something that Paul and Cigna and I have been working on for a long time. Others who've been involved in this include my buddy John Durant, uh, Bob Burkhardt, etc. ECOG, as I mentioned before, is a technique that is screaming for standardization. Uh, it's measured differently at different times. Are we recording from the earlobe? Are we recording from the ear canal? Are we recording from the tympanic membrane? Uh, 
These are values based on TM recordings, but even that isn't standardized. There are a variety of electrodes that have been used, including homemade devices. Uh, these are two commercially available ones, this one by uh, the Lily Wick electrode, but the one I use most often is the TM uh, Temptrode by Sanibel. Uh, signal averaging parameters, we have offered guidelines for that. We have offered guidelines for stimulus parameters. We've offered guidelines for how to interpret and record or measure the electrocochlear gram and have presented this data, but different laboratories and different scientists and different clinicians across the globe really these parameters tend to vary. And until we become more standardized, uh, it will be difficult to compare uh, results across laboratories, across individuals, and across even recording sessions in, in the same patient. So uh, uh, one of the things I would like to do before I finally give up on EPOG uh, is to lead the movement or at least facilitate the movement to help standardize the recording, calls, recording protocols that we use to record uh, measure and interpret the electrocochlear gland. So on that note, I will leave you with my email address and encourage any of you who have questions about any part of this presentation or other questions in areas that I may not have covered that involve the use of auditory evoked potentials or the early evoked potentials in general. I have a lot of experience in this area. Please email me. Uh, I will be at the University of Kansas Medical Center as an emeritus professor beginning uh, in July, and, uh, and then I have about another month to go um, until I, I do retire, but you know, guys like me never really retire. I still find this a very interesting and intriguing area to study and to keep me occupied, especially at times like this when we're barely allowed to leave our homes. So I look forward to your questions uh, to help pass the time away in a very uh, dark period for us here uh, in the world. So thank you very much.